What's good, cannabis investors? I hope you're all doing great, and I want to welcome you back to my channel. If you're new here, my name is Jordan, and today we're coming at you with This Week in Cannabis News from June 3rd to the 9th. Now, before we jump in, if you enjoy this video or you learn something, please just leave a like on it. And of course, if you want to learn more about this generational investment opportunity, subscribe below so that you don't miss any future videos. And then there's plenty of content for you to go back, rewatch, and educate yourself with. Try to think of these videos as a time capsule. I've tried to put all the news and facts in one place so that you can watch episodes over time to learn about the evolution of the U.S. industry, identify top U.S. MSOs that you keep seeing pop up that you think will be worth a lot more in the future than they are now based on their current market caps and new markets coming online, and take advantage whenever you feel ready if you wish to do so. And this is just your weekly reminder not to focus on the share prices because if you do, you're going to have a bad time because we've got plenty of great news, starting with Ohio as applications are now open for dispensaries to apply for rec cannabis licenses. And this allows all 126 to apply to convert, and they expect all of them to. Obviously, they should. Um, why would they not want to get in on this opportunity? But the pros are we go from 140,000 med users up to 2 million adult users. And so as long as we can compete with neighboring states, if you don't make the taxes too high, that shouldn't be an issue. Um, but nonetheless, lots of good stuff happening on the ground in this state-led growth story. And so all these links will be in the comments as always. But another local one from Ohio, as this one cites down here, they're hoping for a week or less of turnaround time for the ones that are prepared. And so that could mean literally by the end of next week. So we love to see that. Um, essentially, just have to wait on uh, the regulators and anyone involved in this to do their job and get it done quickly. But who's going to benefit the most in Ohio? The four MSOs that could get buzzed. Um, and this is from Green Market Report. So just bringing you through it. Now, it seems like they got a lot of this info from Pablo's public report and kind of just rewrote it. But main thing, 42 of the 123 operational stores, so 34% of them are owned by public MSOs. And so everyone on this list is certainly going to benefit, but these are the four that they think will benefit the most. And so take these numbers with a grain of salt because they're obviously estimates, but Vexed, Acreage, The Cannabis, and Ascend. So you can pause to read if you're interested. And the best part is, is the states are not stopping. As fresh out of New Hampshire, as of June 6th, seems they've come to an agreement on the bill to legalize rec cannabis. Now it goes back to both the House and Senate for a final vote, and then it could go to the governor's desk. So I will update you, but why is this a big deal? New Hampshire is set to become number 25. That would be half of the states. And then come November, there's a chance that we had three more. Florida, South Dakota, North Dakota, waiting on Pennsylvania. So lots of promising developments to come. And this is just another write-up on the fact South Dakota is going to try for a third time. Although in 2020, they did vote to legalize. And then basically the governor, Kirsty Noem, uh, shut that down, unfortunately. Very um, un-American and unconstitutional of her. Well, they had another shot in 2022, but that time voters actually rejected the effort by 53%. So... Will third time be the charm for those in South Dakota? We hope so, but we'll find out only in November. While this was a Fox News poll conducted under the joint direction of Beacon Research and Shaw and Company Research, um, so take it with a grain of salt, but the good news is that while we do need, I believe, 63% for legal adult use to go into effect in Florida, question 19, if the election were today, how would you vote on Amendment 3, which would legalize cannabis for adults ages 21 and older? We got 66% back so far. So certainly promising. This link will be in the comments if you wanted to check it out for any of the other questions, which are pretty funny. Um, but with that as well, uh, we do got to follow the money, and that's kind of, that's probably led us all down some interesting rabbit holes. Uh, but wanted to share this prediction from Hirsch Jane. If Gov Ron DeSantis ultimately supports the sale of hemp products in gas stations while opposing the sale of regulated, tested cannabis products in licensed facilities, we will see John Morgan Esquire use his megaphone to expose DeSantis' stupidity and corruption. I certainly hope so. While this is an older one from the end of May, the bill did come around to his desk this past week, and he vetoed the new proposed hemp restrictions, mainly because he wants to use funding from the hemp industry to try and challenge the legal adult use initiative that's going to be on the ballot in November. That would actually provide safe, tested product to Floridians, especially from the female plant that we know, which most of the studies have been conducted about, is the medicine versus whatever the synthetic crap that they can take from CBD, turn it into an alternative THC. Just can't imagine it's the same thing. There's no way. And so he's saying that the new controls would have strangled small businesses that open because of hemp. I don't think so. They just have to use the hemp for what it is. Fiber, all these other materials, use it for constructive shit. Change the world for the better. Don't make a, a shitty fake weed alternative because now we've got to go to war and shit's going to get interesting. And so um, would have restricted sales of hemp-derived products that include alternative forms of THC. The untested and likely unsafe product that's being sold as cannabis that we have no studies on PubMed for, which are marketed to provide the same effects as cannabis, which is likely bullshit. I've never tried it though. If you have, let me know in the comments. 
about more here, why it matters. So, I mean, I explained why it really matters, but links in the comments as always. Now, this is interesting. Do the right thing, said it best. And I had no idea this was going on, but from a strategic standpoint, it does seem like the best way for legal MSOs to play chess as opposed to checkers and get the brand awareness out there. As Will Yakowitz, who writes for Forbes, shared, while GTI Grows hasn't publicly disclosed this, we find out yesterday, it has licensed its Incredibles edible brand to Lifted Maid's Herb to make hemp-derived THC products. One package found in the West Palm Beach hemp store contains 1,500 milligrams of THC. If you can't beat them, join them temporarily until you can beat them, I guess. Let us know in the comments if you've seen this round for some time or not, but shit just gets more and more interesting. As seems like GTI and Cureleaf are getting involved, obviously it makes more sense to license it out and then get the revenue as opposed to having them just rip your brand off. And ultimately, this person's best guess was since Q2 or Q3 of last year. And so definitely a strategic play uh, to have to deal with the hemp problem. Well, uh, this was a fascinating one. James Comer has blasted Hunter Biden for a failed Chinese business deal. Obviously, rightfully so. But new records show Comer is a hypocrite, like all other politicians himself, as he helped import Chinese hemp for a campaign donor's company that was the poster child of his policy initiative, uh, and so I'll put this link in the comments for you to go through. But the main thing that I just want to point out, because if you know, you know, hmm, wonder how McConnell fits in the bastard behind the loophole as his wife is from a wealthy Chinese shipping family. Like, man, this <laughs> shit just never stops. And so fascinating story if you wanted to dive into that more. But one other thing just to highlight is that I've never tried the synthetic crap. Apparently HHC, a semi-synthetic cannabinoid derived from CBD, and from my understanding is nowhere to be found in the female cannabis plant that is the actual medicine that has garnered up say 34,000 studies on PubMed with all of its medical benefits, and there's no conclusive evidence of psychosis being associated with the female cannabis plant. However, it's possible that it could be with this synthetic crap, right? Hence why we want to make it less easy to access. And while Sam has possibly had a point, they purposely probably don't make the distinction because they're frauds like that. And so the main thing is that any issue or any claim that psychosis does come from it, it's the synthetic hemp-derived cannabinoids that are most likely causing it, and it's not the actual female cannabis plant that is the medicine. And so for anyone interested, demons were following me. It does not sound fun. Calls to make HHC illegal as it possibly should be if these are in fact the unintended side effects, or at least shouldn't be as accessible to people if it's gonna do this. Now, main thing to highlight though, if it's not clear at this point, I know I've called out the Dems for years for being shitty, for being frauds, and for not caring about people's health by mandating the mandatory uh, experimental gene therapy, but at the same time, it's so clear as day that the Republicans are not any better. They're also frauds, they're shitty, and they don't care about people's health because DeSantis wants to let these synthetics run rampant, and James Comer clearly working with uh, a foreign adversary to bring a bunch of hemp into the country, benefiting who? China. Um, and then we've got Sam, obviously the fraud prohibitionist, not making the distinction between the actual medicinal plant and hemp. And I wonder why. Always got to follow the money, right? And why I think this all even really matters. It's an older one from CBS, but I found it from December 1st, 2022. Unlicensed cannabis tainted with E. coli, lead, and salmonella study finds. And how accurate is CBS? Because all these news publications are, are shit now. It's a great question. I don't know. I will put the report though in the comments if you wanted to go through it. But if in fact, about 40% of cannabis products sold at unlicensed storefronts in New York City contained bacteria, heavy metals, and pesticides, you'd want to know about it, right? And you would want to likely avoid that product and go to something safer that's going to give you the effects that you actually want. And so, so you can pause to read for a bit more detail, but let it be known, these products are not making it onto PubMed with 34,000 references of medicinal benefits, right? So just important to know the difference and help educate people because man, if we've seen anything in the last few years, People can be fucking dumb in mobs. Well, from Wiley Online Library, um, from May 29th, from high school to higher education, is recreational cannabis a consumption amenity for U.S. colleges? Well, funny you ask, as this researcher found that rec cannabis legalization increases enrollments by approximately up to 9%, fascinating, without compromising degree completion or graduation rate, and it boosts college competitiveness by offering a positive amenity as evidenced by the rise in out-of-state enrollments relative to neighboring states. And again, this is not coming from the synthetic crap. This is the actual cannabis plant. So love to see it. Link in the comments. Well, I found this one too from Science Alert. Fascinating, because I had no idea, but scientists find a cannabis compound inside totally different plants. Isn't that fascinating? So native to Brazil, it's known as Trema Micrantha Bloom, a shrub which grows across much of the South American country and is often considered a weed. Go figure. 
but it's apparently a legal alternative to using cannabis for CBD in Brazil. Um, it's a simpler and cheaper source of cannabis oil, and apparently scientists have previously found CBD in a related plant in Thailand as well. And so who knows if this plant has other properties though that wouldn't be beneficial for humans. And while nature certainly does try to kill us, it doesn't try to kill us as much as the governments usually, and so I feel like you could probably do that and use it for CBD in Brazil if you needed it. So, But one of the bigger stories of this week, and it wasn't too long ago, we were talking about we just need a big M&A deal to happen in this industry, but Ben Kovler wrote to Jim Koch, the legendary founder and chairman of Boston Beer, the maker of Sam Adams, a letter on Sunday, June 2nd, expressing that we think Green Thumb is a better buyer for Sam shareholders. And he makes a very good point. And so love this letter that Ben posted on here. Obviously, links in the comments if you can't read this too clearly. But he does highlight that if the two of them combined... Um, they would have over $3 billion in net revenue, adjusted EBITDA of $536 million, and cash flow from operations of $490 million. And I think a lot of that would be coming from Green Thumb and doing some of the heavy lifting. And so, obviously, fascinating, and we love seeing this thrown into the mix. Well, this is a Wall Street Journal write-up on the topic. Cannabis producer seeks Boston beer merger. Now it's likely behind a paywall. So thank you, Ben, for actually copying and pasting the full text here. So for anyone that just wants a second story with more perspective on it, you can pause to read. Well, a bit more down here. Links will be in the comments. Well, um, this was an interesting development this past week. BlackRock and Citadel, two obviously evil companies doing a lot of uh, nefarious things, plan to launch a new national stock exchange in Texas to compete with the New York Stock Exchange. And my first thought when I saw this was like, my God, wouldn't this be a way for them to get into cannabis very, very cheap? Will they let the thumb list? Um, it'd be great, but who knows, right? So just sharing this because I thought it was interesting. While this is a report from Pablo, thank you JT and LA for sharing it and summarizing, but with rescheduling likely before uh, January 20th, 2025, in our opinion, and in accomplishing, accompanying, sorry, DOJ memo, call it Garland Memo or Cole Memo 2.0, we think outsiders, whether Canadian LPs, beer, tobacco, and other CPG companies, even pharma may have a limited time window to act, which means now until then is likely the best time for us to see more and more mergers, potential mergers, I should say, like we're seeing Ben write that letter to uh, to Boston Beer. And so this is Pablo's report for anyone that is interested, a uh, review of the potential merger with um, Boston Beer. And uh, just my computer's on the fritz today. I might need to get a new laptop at some point because it's just ridiculous. But moving along, thanks, Todd, for sharing what Jeffries has to say on it. Now, this is purely speculation as it hasn't happened yet, but for anyone interested, would provide a pathway for GTI listing on a major exchange while also allowing... Uh, Sam to capitalize on a growing shift from alcohol to cannabis. And how ironic is it that their stock ticker just happens to be SAM, much like those fraudulent propagandist pricks. And so we did get a safe update, though, which was surprising. And while it's still just only in the House, uh, we're going to share what our favorite D.C. lobbyist Don Murphy has to say on it. We got safe banking budget and D.C. AU language from House GOPs. Thank you, Rep. Dave Joyce, one of the few politicians actually delivering for Americans and intel on the Senate's foot dragging. And so take it away, Don. Friends, Don Murphy, I know it's been a long time, but I just wanted to share some uh, pretty good news. Good to see Any you back, day Don. Republicans in control of the House push legislation to help fix the banking issue and or the D.C. Uh, commercial cannabis issue is a good day. Now, that said, uh, it's starting to become evident to me that safe banking is being held up in large measure because of a... Uh, consumer credit card bill pushed by Durbin and Marshall, a bipartisan bill uh, that might be attached. And that's why uh, Leader Schumer can't bring it to the floor right now. Uh, so that is a problem for Democrats, frontline um, candidates, Tester and Brown and Rosen and maybe a few others. Uh, that's, that's a holdup, that's a problem. So that is what causes me to think that safe banking ends up happening after the election in the lame duck. So there's some good news and some bad news, but I just wanted to share it with you. I'll be in New York tomorrow if you're heading to that expo there. Uh, so plan accordingly for your own situation, folks, but uh, doesn't politics just suck? And so again, my computer on the fritz, but do the right thing. The House passed the VA spending bill in two weeks from subcommittee to full committee to full House vote. They'll meet as full committee next week to mark up the financial services bill, which apparently includes the safe light language with similar timing. 
we are looking at a house floor vote in the next few weeks. So we'll be updated in the coming weeks, but great comment here from Turbo. Not holding my breath. None of us are because we've had this carrot sadly dangled in front of our faces too many times. But next steps would be to pass full committee and pass the house floor, then negotiate a final deal with the Senate. And apparently Gov funding runs out September 30th, so it's possible that this bill needs to get passed by then. And why could this time actually be different? Thank you, Todd, for sharing what Jeffries has to say on it so we can compare it with what we know and learn a little bit more. New perspective as GOP House Committee presented its 2025 spending bill. Instead of providing protection to depository institutions as safe banking would, the language provides protections to all financial institutions. So that is promising, uh, right? Includes banks as well as brokers or dealers in securities. That's why this time could be different with a new Cole memo coming as the stage is set and we just gotta let time unfold and be ready. And so apparently the text is on page 30. So notice something interesting. It's good that none of the funds made available by this act may be used to penalize a financial institution solely for working with a cannabis business. But note how these bastards all put hemp-derived cannabis businesses before the actual businesses that are providing safer non-addictive medicinal alternatives and fighting back against the opioid epidemic and crisis. So it's, it's why we can't have nice things. Politicians suck. Can't believe any of the shit they say. Well, from Financial Times, on to MSO News. Truly announces opening of 200th dispensary. Good for them. Um, in Brooksville, Florida. And opening will be next Friday, June 14th, and more here if you wanted to pause to read about basically what's copy and pasted in every single True Leaf press release. Well, Ken Investments, thanks for sharing this, as looks like four near-term store openings for Green Thumb Industries, two new ones in Florida, one in New York, and one in Minnesota. And so uh, just wanted to share that if anyone's interested, especially if you're a Green Thumb shareholder, certainly still the best and healthiest to be invested in. While Canopy Growth moves to acquire acreage holdings in a two-step deal. And so it seems like they have exercised their option and the staged acquisition supported by the credit facility aims to bring acreage fully into Canopy USA fold by mid 2025. And hey, if only acreage wasn't such a dumpster fire of a company. Um, but this is again, another precedent, which will hopefully bring us closer to uplisting, which will put money in everybody's TFSAs and Roth IRAs and ultimately allow us to get off the internet for damn good. But yeah, you can pause to read if you're interested. A lot of detail here. Pause to read a little bit more. Wanted to just highlight at the bottom, the lead up. With the announcement, they've exercised the option to acquire them nearly five years after the initial agreement. Always takes longer than expected, right? Politics, damn. But sales, Illinois finally published this as of May 31st. Um, good to see that in April, we saw a total record number of items sold, even more than in March, which did outsell April. But nonetheless, strong sales across the board. In-state sales, 111 mil. Out-of-state, 33 for a total of 144 million. So while it is less than March, even while having 420, I believe it's roughly 9 or 10% up from last year. So... Good to see as more and more stores are opening and giving actual access to opportunity to more and more people in Illinois, we're seeing more sales and people are voting for legal cannabis with their dollars. Well, April had 420, but not high cannabis sales growth, according to Alan Shitstein at New Cannabis Ventures. And so Western markets, read it and weep, sequential growth, not much, but California did. So good to see that annual growth. Uh, West Coast markets are obviously struggling more than the East Coast ones as there's likely more illicit cannabis over there, but I'd still say promising growth for a lot of these markets, sequential. Florida Med only, still up 2.6%. Um, Illinois, 0.5% from the month prior, actually. Oh, that's total, oh, adult use and medical. We're just looking at adult use, that just confused me. Maryland down from March, which is again, always the first big month of the year, but up 136.7% from last year when they had medical only. So that's the kind of growth we're excited to see Ohio bring us, um, Massachusetts down a little bit, but up 3.4% from last year. Michigan down a little bit, but up 13.2%, while Pennsylvania still met only. Uh, and this is the last big market that we're looking out for. And so with that, we got a good one here from Greenwave Advisors. With Ohio Rec coming online this month, what can we expect as an average spend per month? Likely consistent with medical cannabis spending trends plus or minus. And so looking back at a lot of the markets since 2014, Note that spending does seem to be quite a bit higher in the years of 2020 and 2021, mainly because that's when cannabis was deemed essential and the Dems just gave everyone a bunch of free money to feel better about themselves for the shit that they put us all through. But with that, on to some more state news. Washingtonian, um, is the Harris Rider that prohibits legal weed in D.C. actually gone? Apparently. As the House Committee on Appropriations released the text of a draft financial services and general government spending bill Tuesday with one big omission, language that Maryland Congressman Andy Harris has inserted into must-pass spending bills every year since D.C. voters voted to legalize possession and gifts of weed in 2013. So imagine that. D.C. can finally get their legal weed market. And what this article also 
doesn't highlight is that this is that same bill that has the new safe light language included in it too. And so, hey, certainly a win. So for anyone interested, you can pause to read or grab the link in the comments. While well, moving along from Christopher Norman, our favorite source out of New Jersey. Thank you, Chris, as New Jersey's now up to 140 cannabis dispensaries two months after they hit 123. And so nice to see them chugging along. Open more stores. You're going to get more legal sales. You're going to have more public health victories and more benefits to everyone in your state. It's common sense at this point because we've seen so many states do it already. And it's just night and day. Well, from Joe Rossi, uh, Donna Lopardo has introduced legislation that would authorize the New York Cannabis Control Board to issue a cannabis event permit to licensees authorized to conduct retail sales of adult use cannabis and cannabis products. So small win out of the shit show that is New York, but seems like those that are offering retail sales right now through adult use dispensaries will be able to sell their products through events or cannabis events uh, once this bill eventually passes. And so we'll update you there. New York needs all the help they can get after they fire and gut their Office of Cannabis Management and put some competent people in there. While from the National Law Review proposed cannabis reschedule sidesteps state law effects. The main reason I'm sharing this, it's a long dry one. Uh, I invite you to pause to read, but scrolling down to the juice, positive effects of rescheduling. One immediate positive effect of moving cannabis to Schedule 3 is that cannabis companies will avoid the draconian impact of Section 280E of the Internal Revenue Code, which prevents most business deductions and results in exceedingly high tax rates that have impeded the industry thus far. Yet, they're still where they're at, despite having both hands tied behind their back. So, good for them. Well, we can also expect better access to commercial banking, new financial services products offered to cannabis companies, and new listing on public exchanges. Finally, the day we've all been waiting for, for these few American-made companies that are actually changing the status quo for the better. While access to federal funding for important cannabis research likewise will be relaxed, and in addition, moving cannabis to Schedule 3 will mean that an insurance company's risk of violation of the Bank Secrecy Act and anti-money laundering statutes will effectively end. The Department of the Treasury, through its Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, FinCEN, will almost certainly issue new guidelines that clarify this after the final rules are approved. In that event, new insurance companies, underwriters, and brokers will likely enter the space, and the potential for reputational risk will erode further. And all we can do is wait and see. And my computer is frozen. So uh, more here if you wanted to pause to read. And all the sources cited at the bottom, links are all in the comments. And I would love to take you to this next page if my fucking computer would allow it. All right, from StratCan, Health Canada proposes numerous significant regulatory changes. For detail on this process, Health Canada released numerous proposed regulatory changes to the cannabis rules and regulations on June 7th as part of a 30-day consultation process ending on July 8th, 2024. And so I'm not going to go through all of them because it's super boring too. I invite you to pause read if you're interested. These proposed changes include, and a lot of them are just dumb um, ultimately, but like imagine still talking about this only in Canada. I'm sure there's a lot of hilarious liberals in the US too, but like one thing would just be, hey, can we get delivery again? Because that was dope. Um, but down here, I mean, there's another one that was just like allowing for differentiation in color between the lid or cap of a container. Come on, like that's just so dumb. <laughs> so anyways, that is the proposed rule changes out of Canada. While um, from Pablo, June 3rd, Canada, rec trends through May. For anyone that's interested, 15 page report. Um, this will be in the comments as well. If you wanna know how Canada is doing and what companies are benefiting there the most. And last few stories from the Dank Informer. This was a great find. I uh, appreciate you for finding this. Betting Bruiser coming through with the Cass banger today was just epic. And now we know Dougie Cass has been playing this industry um, and he's been buying low, selling high, as a trader like him should. Um, but fascinating that I guess Betting Bruiser tweeted this. Hey, Doug Cass, I'm still waiting for my free luncheon at mar lago Oh, I guess he viewed, yeah, I guess I'm blocked by Doug Cass too. But yeah, free luncheon at Mar-a-Lago that you owe me. Don't ghost us on Twitter again. Was hoping you are looking for a protege since your son Ethan is sadly banned by the SEC from the securities industry for life. And it's like, oh shit, did not know that. Um, and if we actually look it up, see for yourself, Dank Informa did the work, so thank you, man. Um, we find that, yeah, Ethan Cass definitely got caught. And what is the detail again if we go back? All these links will be in the comments if you want to check it out. Sun pays SEC for alleged $8.5 in rogue trades at Circle T. And if you still think this market is not being manipulated, I think you're dumb. Well, last one um, from Do the Right Thing. Nothing is happening this summer. Let's check. Just to recap, essentially, a summary of where we're at, how the momentum continues to pick up despite, you know, little to no price action that's positive to us because again, that's not retail doing it. There's certainly some things that can be done on the back end, especially with you over-the-counter markets 
that we can't control. All we can do is plan accordingly for our own situation, um, choose the, the best horses that we think are going to you know, win in the long run, and grab our popcorn. But essentially, Ohio is going live, hopefully sooner than later. Scott's miracle Grow m and with Consortium sort of paved the way for Canopy to exercise their option and get into acreage there. Green Thumb publicly reveals it wants to merge with Big Alcohol and surprise safe language in the 2025 fiscal spending bill. But yeah, nothing's happening, right? So hope you all have a great Sunday. But that is it for today's episode, folks. Thank you so much for tuning in. I really hope you got some value out of it. What did you think of the stories mentioned? Let me know in the comments if you have any questions or suggestions, and I'd be happy to address them. But besides that, if you enjoyed this video and you learned something, please just leave a like on it. Subscribe below if you want to keep following along and don't want to miss any future videos. And I'll catch you next week for This Week in Cannabis News. Take care, everybody.